Stay free with me, Russell Brand. We were talking about how a figure like Elon Musk may be controversial, even if he's ultimately pursuing self-interests, because he's purchase of Twitter prevents the control of the public sphere in a way that would be ultimately amenable to the establishment. A shared objective to create a unipolar world, a kind of you know, new world order, a one world government one way or another, even if it's implicit and tacit rather than overt and explicit. And obviously Russia have their own Weltanschauung, obviously China have their own uh, uh, agenda. Thank you. I'm glad I got the Weltanschauung nod there. Thank you from a Columbia <laughs> professor. Do you think that's true of Elon Musk? Is he a disruptor in some way, even if he is not ultimately unique among billionaires? The, the level of discussion we have in general is pretty miserable. I don't know if Twitter can really solve that because, uh, you know, dealing with these problems uh, in tweets is, is part of our problem, actually, I have to say. It's, it's probably not the solution. Uh, we're just not doing a very good job of understanding the complete mess that we're in. And the U.S. lies uh, for a living, as we know. The mainstream media do nothing about it and uh, just repeat the lies, amplify them, and it's getting pretty dangerous. That's, that's the real problem. It's a very dangerous time right now because we seem not to be able to have an adult conversation about almost anything in, in, in the mainstream. What in particular does your ascent into public consciousness demonstrate? Why is it impossible to have these conversations? Why is there a tightening? Why is there more censorship? It seems to be altering. Forget the shifting perspectives of the left and right and, and this new liberal authoritarianism that seems to be emerging. Why is there now such a demented attempt to control the public space and the public narrative? And your personal experience surely speaks to that, being shut down publicly when sort of talking about the, the, the Nord Stream pipeline, when talking about Wuhan. Tell me what you think is driving this new extreme sensorialism. It, it's, it's a little bit hard to know. You know, it, in my youth, which was a very long time ago, it, it, newspapers like the Washington Post and, and New York Times actually enjoyed dissing on political figures. I, I grew up when we were uh, getting rid of Richard Nixon uh, because of all the lies. But now these papers don't do anything but repeat the lies. And it's extremely strange for me. You know, I know a lot of the reporters. They tell me privately, yeah, what you're saying is right, but, uh, you know, our editor's not so interested in it. It is really a, a, a big question. I don't think there's a simple answer. Of course, corporate ownership, yes, it's definitely part of it. But the complete collapse of professionalism in journalism in these mainstream media, not everywhere, because there are some really brave people out there, but in what we call the mainstream is pathetic and very dangerous because we're deep into a war that is escalating and we can't even have a, a decent discussion about what the sources of this war are or how to end it. I had the experience I, I wrote for one syndicate, project syndicate for 20 years. I was their most published writer, but they wouldn't print the pieces that I wrote that were contrary to the official line about this war. And it, it was pretty amazing to me after 20 years, I couldn't even post a piece. And that that's not good in, in my view. Nowadays, Woodward and Bernstein would be doing their work online. Even in recent memory, exactly. a figure like Chris Hedges has gone from being a, a Pulitzer Prize winner with the New York Times to having his content taken off YouTube because he was like interviewing Zizek or Edward Snowden on Russia Today. And when it comes to this war in particular, Jeffrey, when you have figures like Noam Chomsky and Donald Trump advocating for diplomacy and ultimately peace, what does it tell you about the sort of central space and how ra radically it's being controlled? And, and what does this level of control suggest to you? Well, you know, what I've seen, because I've, I've really lived it and I've been, in, I've been involved with dozens of governments across the world for 40 years now, basically the neocons took over U.S. foreign policy 30 years ago. 
and it hasn't really mattered whether it's Democrats or Republicans. It didn't really matter uh, whether it was uh, Bush uh, Jr. or Obama or Biden. The weirdest thing is Trump, who's a nut, in my view, uh, and a dangerous one, by the way. I want to be clear about that. He's the one that didn't make wars during his four years. Uh, the others all were engaged in wars. Uh, and that's not a good sign. The mainstream of our political system in both parties is militarized. And our foreign policy is largely based on secrecy also. Uh, and so we don't even see what our government's doing. Nothing is explained. Uh, nothing is debated anymore. And that's been true for a long time, but it's been true across the administration. So it's not a partisan thing. You know, we had Bush, who I thought was the worst imaginable president during his term. OK, then Obama came in and, and Obama made wars again the same way in Syria, a presidential order to the CIA to overthrow Assad, not reported by the mainstream media at all. Uh, this NATO operation to overthrow Gaddafi never explained. And it really goes on and on. And now we're in a war in uh, Ukraine, I mean, and we are in it. This is absolutely a war between the United States and Russia. It's extraordinarily dangerous. We're told every day in the mainstream media an unprovoked war that started on February 24th, 2022, which is false. There's a history to this. There was a way to avoid this war. Uh, Biden didn't choose it, but none of it is properly debated at all. So that, that's, that's really what we're facing. You know, pretty interesting who blew up the Nord Stream pipeline. Uh, one president I know said, if Russia invades, that's the end of the pipeline. And uh, then when asked, well, what do you mean, Mr. President? He says, we have our ways. And then after the pipeline's blown up, the Secretary of State says, this is a tremendous opportunity uh, to uh, wean uh, Europe from Russia. Well, what's the narrative? The narrative is, well, Russia did it. And the newspapers say, well, duh, yeah, the U.S. officials say Russia did it. Russia blew up its own uh, pipeline, its own billions of dollars of infrastructure, the, the pipeline that carries Russian energy to European markets, uh, which was a lot of the point uh, of this, whereas the other side said they were going to do it. So this is this narrative business. It's really pretty clear, obviously, when I said that thing on U.S. television a couple of weeks ago, that was that face because they stopped me. I was supposed to be on for usually typically a half an hour on that show. And after three minutes, they said, well, that's enough, Mr. Sachs. Uh, and then the, uh, the, the, the moderator went on a kind of five minute rant, which I got to hear because they cut me off of the show, but they left me on Zoom, so I got to hear the rest of it. So watch what you say afterwards, if you're, unless you cut me off. Uh, but they went on a five-minute rant about me. This guy doesn't know anything. Why do we have an economist talking about this and so forth? Uh, and the answer is I've been involved in diplomacy in more than 100 countries for decades, and so I watch these things, and I have something to say about them. It's extraordinary that even words like doves and hawks, common idioms that used to define the potential for polarity in these conversations, have kind of drifted from the common lexicon. There is nobody taking up that side of the argument. I suppose there is. There's Tucker Carlson, there's Noam Chomsky, there's Donald Trump. But it's in some cases, I imagine it's just sort of anti-establishment, motivated by the kind of dualistic nature of American politics rather than a genuine appetite for real peace. What was it very interesting to hear there, Jeffrey, was like that with, with case after case, we are seeing whether it's the war, NATO expansionism, meddling in foreign democracies, a sort of a kind of psychotic, vampiric recklessness followed by maddening lies. Watch entire episodes on demand for free at rumble forward slash Russell Brand.